Why are we want to do ink now? It's a very difficult, tricky, ornery, frustrating medium with lots of difficulties involved and lots of big benefits as well. But the number one reason we introduce ink at this point, and I've been doing it for the past two or three years, is because it's an ideal strategy, strategy training procedure. Not because it's a technique or a style or a particularly special medium, but because it's very unforgiving, which is its main benefit, we use it as a kind of a strategy, forward thinking, uh, planning trainer. There's all sorts of things you need to have in mind when you, when you uh, work in ink. We're going to work with this amazing, beautiful architectural still life here. We're going to work on just a small section of it if you want, or if you're crazy, we'll take on a big lot. And if you're out completely insane, you'll do the whole lot. I intend to do about four or five square inches. Um, the, the kind of forward thinking you need to do with ink is, comes along the following lines. First of all, you need to be planning out, and I mean thinking ahead and planning out, uh, your chord of tones. The kind of uh, relationship between light, dark and medium uh, aspects of what you're looking at. And above everything else, you're white. You need to know what you're leaving white because I say leaving any white in your drawing in this method can and must only be white paper. So it's that which is left behind. This means it's really essential that you know beforehand. You can't add any white over the top. If you've missed a section, that's too bad. Part of the attitude of working with ink is that it takes a fair bit of confidence and courage because you will make mistakes, but with this medium you really can't go back and correct them. So you have to have a different attitude to mistakes. You have to kind of embrace them a little bit. Um, you, just as much as you're planning your tonal attack, you need to plan your shape simplification attack. But let's get back to tones first of all. First thing we're going to do is have a good look at this and decide whether there is any white at all. So Lewis, from where you're standing or sitting, can you see any white? You can sort of see implied in the way I'm asking the question that it's not a straightforward map. Yeah. It's what you define white in terms of like the, uh, the darkest colors, the dark shades, and the light shades, and choosing whether or not to represent them as white. Or, if you're going to be absolute, you're right, but if you're going to be absolutist about it, you can say, yes, there is white. It's the, it's the color of uh, sunlight, unimpeached, un, un, uh, diluted sunlight. You know, I'm going to say, is there any of it there? The, the quick thing to do though is you have one, you're looking at this, quickly look out the window and look at a white cloud, sunlit white cloud and go, is it as white as that? Well, probably not. So you're already working on a relative scale. And the same goes with, is there any black? And it, whatever there is, how is this chord of tones in the area that you're looking at, how is it distributed? Well, the first thing to note is that there's an infinite number of tones. This is problem number one. There are an infinite number of tones. So obviously you're going to have to make some decisions about what you're going to put in and leave out. In as much as I'm asking you now to affect this in only four or five tones, that's a lot of leaving out. A lot of harsh decisions have to be made about what uh, how you choose each tone. So, these are thresholding decisions. Anyone that's done any 
histograms or using Photoshop software or anything where there's you decide where on a scale you're going to call black or white. Where you where you have the threshold between one tone and then and the next. It's your decision. The decisions are best made aesthetically on the basis of some aesthetic judgment. There's no truth necessarily that you can uphold by saying it is definitely this or that. So you're going to have to make a decision about how you use these tones, how you apportion them. And, but the way I like to think about it is as a chord of tones. So if that's white and that's black and there's however many steps in between, you're going to say, well, I am going to have white. I've got how many colours have I got left now? Three. Uh, it's going to be, I think, one more really light one and then only that one and that one. Or is it what? And based on what? Each chord has an overall mood, it could be argued. Each chord has a, diff has a, has a sense, has a feel. And if you, say, looked at the end wall there and all, all of these tones, you'd say that chord is, well, it's all up here. It's got a kind of washed out, boring, curtain, end wall kind of flavour. So you need to pick your chords and you need to test them out. You test them out on a piece of paper, not in your head, but you, you should have something that looks like this with multiple tests on it. You could even call them, all of these, as, they're all tests in a way as well. But ideally you'll have lots of strips where you're testing the colour. So, while we're still on the tonal chord issue, how do I make different tones with this ink? There are two main ways, straightforward. One is to pre-mix in your little palette a range of tones. And the other is to use one tone but multiple layers of it. Today I'm going to ask you to use that latter method. One, a light to middle range diluted ink and practice getting your tonal ranges by the number of layers. This is not a method I would always use. It's, it's a little bit too purist to be always um, functional but it, it's ideal for this starting out method. The method I'm teaching is a kind of very classical purist method, only because that's a good place to start. It's not what I would use myself in a normal situation, but really helpful to see in action. Um, why did we write a kind of haiku? What was I thinking? Minimum number of lines. Minimum, a minimising kind of thinking. Um, obviously, the same ap applies to shape as it does to the tonal range. There's an infinite number of shapes. You're going to need to subtract and minimise and refine, simplify the shape situation. On what basis? On an aesthetic basis, on, on a question of choice. So, and again, that's, that's going to be your decision. A lot of what we've been doing so far has been about shape, whole shape, enclosed shape, shape design, and composing with shape. So you start to apply that thinking now in the way you design these artworks. A really, really important point. Half tones, you know, soft divisions between one tone and another. In this method, no. You've either got this tone or you've got that tone. There's no blending, there's no half tone, there's no softening. You get your result by having the correct faceting of tone, by having the right tone next to the right tone. It's one of the reasons also why we pick this material, because it kind of folds and pleats in a crystalline, faceted kind of way. At one level, this kind of material makes your life a little bit easier. It also makes it a lot harder in some other ways, but that's fun. So no blending. The next really important thing, and you'll hear me say this countless times, I hope not today, let it dry. 
With this method, you put a coat of tone down and you let it dry. And while it's drying, you work on the next drawing and the next drawing. And it's common with this method to have three or four on the go at once. If you go back into it while it's wet, you will ruin it, pure and simple. You have to let it dry. I'm recommending that you use the biggest brush that you've got to hand and become dexterous with the use of a big brush, so that, that kind of size brush. If you can develop a fair bit of acuity and dexterity with a big brush, when you come to a little brush, which probably you won't have to, um, you'll, you'll find you've got an amazing degree more skill than if you rely on using little fine brushes. What else do we need to say? Don't go uphill. Really works a lot better, ink, if you work down the page. And, and this is part of the timing issue. And you'll see when I do a little demo what I mean by that. I, I always think of the, the best analogy in, for making this material behave um, is not to be painting something in, but that you are moving a fluid pool, pool of ink around and shaping it. If you've got, what's a good analogy? So, if you're, if you're icing a cake, you're not grinding that icing into the surface of the cake, you've got a puddle of stuff which you are shaping across the top of the cake. That's the way to think of that meniscus of the pool of ink. You're pushing that pool around and giving that pool a shape with the brush. Okay, what else do we need to talk about? Um, they're, they're the kind of key attitudinal things. Probably the most important one of all is to remember that it is very difficult to control this medium in an absolute sort of way. You can fully expect that it'll be disobedient. And this is part of its um, part of its pleasure and part of its joy, the fact that it does the unexpected a little bit. But because it does some unexpected things doesn't mean you want to start riding that chaos too early. You want to dominate this medium to the degree that it can be dominated. It will still kick you around no matter what you do, but get on top of it. And one of the best ways to get on top of it is to believe me when I say, let it dry. Don't go uphill. That means don't go back up the slope. And don't fiddle around with it and try and correct something too much. Uh, if you've made a little mistake, it's better to let it go and correct it next time around. Or don't make that mistake next time around. Fiddle with ink. What actually happens is it tends to draw the viewer's attention to where you've tried to do the surgery repair. And that's all that happens. And you start to notice the, 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 all of the faults instead of all of the, the rush. And there's a fair bit of rush in ink. So any questions to that point? I guess what I'm trying to say is be wary of this medium, but be confident with it and dominate it. Don't, don't be uh, nervous with it. Now, we're going to do a little bit of demo work to show you how I would approach this in a classical kind of way. So if you can't see from where you're sitting, you might want to uh, come back around. I've just got to know out of curiosity, what was that outside? What would you say about the sand of floors? I can smell it. I smell it full of air full of music. Terrific. I, I think we're, we're actually going to need to air can turn the air on back no, it's on. it's even stronger. Mm. Or open the door. Can, can we open the door? Yeah. Thanks. So, a few, a few of the real ordinary housekeeping issues with this. The way you address the work is really, really important. You do want to be on the right angle. You want to be at about... 45 degrees or, or a fraction less. Now that means you've got to organise yourself to sit in that way. 
at that level, you'll find that the ink moves down the page at exactly the right, with the right degree of control. Obviously, if it's too steep, it'll run off the paper. If it's too shallow, it won't flow down and fill in the uh, spaces properly. So, the first thing you need to do is learn how to make a, a simple, um, classical wash, just a plain old wash. If you can get the clip on the paper. There's, there's a few different ways of doing that, but ideally you want to get the biggest brush. You need to practice on little small sections at a time until you've got it working for you. Here I've got three dilutions, extremely weak, pure black, and kind of a mid-tone. You want to get the brush absolutely sodden, completely full right to the hilt, and then you just wipe off that last drop, and that's about the amount of ink laden that you want. Once I start, I probably won't be able to talk very much because you, you're concentrating on, on your hand movement, etc. So, some key things. First of all, the touch. It's extremely gentle. You, if you watch the brush, you'll see that I'm not bending the blade of the hairs of the brush. I'm just guiding that ink along. Uh, here's the alternative. Squeezing the brush, that's what you're not doing. Also, there's a certain amount of speed, and the brush has to be laden to a very particular degree. So I'm going to just quickly go. So this is about the approach. So you can see that's only just in control. It's nearly running down the page. And you can start to see when it needs reloading. When it gets to that point, as the bead builds up along the bottom, you come in with a damp brush, if you want, and sop up that little bead, just by capillary action. There's no need to rub, just let the brush pick up. If you don't pick up that ink at the bottom, you've got a well of ink that will, by capillary action, flow back up the page and give you a, a sort of a bloom mark. Now you guys who've done this before, if you want to sit down and do some ink drawing, you're very welcome to go and do that, but watch if you wish. So that's, that's one way of doing it. Another way to do it and get a slightly better result is to use damp paper. You apply water just as you would, oops, there's a bit of ink in there, just as you would the ink in a pretty controlled kind of way. It don't have to be quite as fussy. But you want it flowing in an even way. And you can also use this method to shape, to produce a controlled shape. So if you want to get fine shapes in something, you can use this method to lead the ink into the shapes you want. So you need that to be damp, not, not running wet. So if you get down, down light, you can see just a faint degree of glint off the surface. While that's drying a little bit, it's kind of not abnormal to do a little bit of line drawing to work out where you're going with an ink drawing. Uh, it's pretty standard. However, you definitely don't want to be doing any, any shading and you want to keep the amount of lead or graphite on that surface to a real minimum. You don't want to have lines that you need to get rid of later. You can erase the lines to a degree through the ink, but only to a slight degree. And while that's coming back to dry, we can come back in. To always make a mark to just check how much paint's on your brush. You can see how that's ready to run down the page a little bit. It's probably a little bit too wet. I should have waited a bit. The beauty of this is it gives you a more even wash. 
and then it'll run the ink, if you've got it right, down into the shapes you want. And if you've got a very articulate shapes that it's hard to get your brush into, sometimes if you get this timing right, just the water will draw the ink into the, into the shape. And when that dries, it'll have a slightly different quality to that. So they're, they're, that's standard, um, a standard wash. So in this method that we're going to do today, you, you, your first thing is you're working out where is the pure white. So the first job is you give everything except where there is pure white one coat. I'll say that again. Everything except where the pure white is gets a coat of ink. Normally you'd make that a relatively dilute one, but that decision is going to have to be yours. How dilute? Generally expect to have a fair bit on your floor and on your clothes, and you always test things at that. You'll find that this Chinese ink um, dries out a little bit lighter than it goes on, so you need to allow for that. It's not a lot of difference, but there's some. And it's changed a little bit by the different kind of papers you use. So supposing this was my um, the, work, the, the piece I was working from, and I've decided that that bit there is white. Just to be really clear, what I'm saying is, this is how you approach it. This. classical than that classical wash, but well, trying not to go uphill. I'm beyond without that much. Tempting to go back and fill in mistakes, better not to make them in the first place. If you make a little mistake, let them sit. You want that ink all at the same degree of dry, uh, wet and dry, if you possibly can. What we've got happening up the top there is where I would get my able assistant to rush in and pick up that little bead that's too wet at the top. You can see I'm using the shape of the brush to do a lot of the work. there and get that little bit so that that doesn't send a bloom back into the thing. And then you let it dry. And when I say let it dry, I mean let it dry, let it dry. Almost everybody rushes in prematurely and tries to work back into it while it's wet and that, as I say, that will spoil the, the job. We'll see, I'll give you a little look at what happens if you work back into it, even when it looks to be uh, dry, but it's slightly wet. See how the mark will, give, will have these kind of ragged edges? And that, uh, that fuzzing out will continue on for a few seconds after you've made the mark. So if you're trying to make a controlled mark, it wants to be bone dry underneath. So you let it dry at that stage, you put up with these little things that happen and when it's completely dry you go back in and you do your next coat. So in the next coat you'll do everything, um, give everything a coat except what is white and the next lightest tone. And that's how you begin that process. So any questions on that to get to that point? Were you using pure black or water done? That's about a fifth. A fifth, yeah. Something like that. It's very strong stuff. More questions? What did I forget to say? I said because I gave this talk this morning, I feel like I've 
not covered everything. Or become more efficient. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, th probably that. <laughs> that's probably enough to, to make a start on. That's, that's the way you would uh, make a start. A lot of the other issues come down to brush dexterity. I will talk just for a sec about that. Ideally, you've got a range of brushes. Um, the, the best brush profile for, um, for ink is, is this kind of shape, where you've got a fat halved up in here, a fat kind of reservoir that comes to a fairly long point. These are not ideal. They don't hold enough ink. Um, I was told today that there's a special on at Cannington Red Dot Store where they're selling a Montmartre, beautiful Montmartre, sable-like brushes, they're not real sable, for seven dollars for four or something, and they're fabulous. They're, I don't know how they could be doing it. Where is it? Red Dot somewhere, Maddington, Cannington, Carrington, something like that. So, um, with Mostly I've talked about this kind of classical thing when you're bringing a perfect wash down. More often than not, you will have more convoluted shapes than these simple forms. And so you're going to be ducking and weaving around complex forms. Um, and that's when it gets really interesting. That's when you're trying to keep the whole thing coming down the page at the same, in the same wet, but with sufficient articulation and dexterity to get around all the nooks and crannies and shapes that you want. So you typically find yourself doing something like, sometimes you've just got to be a little bit quicker and you can't afford to do perfect brush technique, you've got to get there, you've got to get to that shape. So as long as you're not scrubbing, it's okay to use the brush from any angle, but you're not, you don't want to hear this. That's right, that should make you wince. You do not want to abrade the surface, unless you specifically, for some reason, after that exact texture. You want to be, like I said, shifting a pool of ink into a desired shape. So most of the time, that action is pulling the brush, dragging, uh, pulling it along its, the length of its hair. You definitely want to avoid doing brushing across immediately see what happens if you go across the hair, the mark fills up with ink. Unless you've got it absolutely sodden. But even then the bottom of the mark has a is a different profile than the top. You want to be able to control both the top and the bottom of the mark. Get the shape of the brush to give you the, so the, the rough edge is intentional. If you want if you do a brush a, a rough edge it can only be because you want to do it. It doesn't want to be an automatic thing. Mm. What else? Questions? How long till my first coffee? Mm. Questions? Murray, have I forgotten to say something that you overheard? Had enough for now. You probably need to get going and have a, have a, have a go. All right. Let's make a start. As we go around, things will occur.